Hello and welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I am your host, Joe Hollywood. And once again, I am joined by Maginos Pete. Hey, hey. And I'm joined by H.H. H. Walker. Oh, let's go. <laughs> That's where the nickname is. Andrew H.H. H. Holmes. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, there we go. Some foreshadowing of some scariness. Coming at you later, folks. You know what? Uh, I, I feel like I need to start this podcast off with an apology. I was doing some research this week for today's topic, and I typed in Google uh, Hollywood crime scenes, like famous Hollywood crime scenes, and this podcast comes up, and I'm like, is that my podcast? And I look, and it is not my podcast. There's another podcast out there called Hollywood Crime Scene. You know what? I, I did come across that, too, uh, several months ago, um, <laughs> and I forgot to mention it to you guys, but... Hey. Uh, are they older than a year? Yes. Yeah, yeah they go. <laughs> oh. And they do it almost weekly. Like, I don't know where they're getting all their content from. Oh, wow. But all right. uh, our apologies to the producers of the other uh, Hollywood Crime Scene yes, podcast. Yes, th- the, the name was completely the brainchild of Joe, I believe. Yeah. Correctly. So, yeah, yes, and I, I'm is... surprised I've never come across that podcast before yes. uh, this week. Um, so Easy solve. The Hollywood crime scene. Yeah, yeah right. Who does it all the time? <laughs> or we need to get a little TM trademarked at the end. That's right. Yeah, maybe I could be register that. it real quick. Right. Yeah, register it. <laughs> uh, now, the name of this podcast is Hollywood Crime Scene, and that's kind of the theme of today's podcast is um, notorious locations, uh, crime scene locations that um, are pretty famous, I think, uh, or just have a fascinating story behind it. And one of the uh, places I want to start off with is kind of near and dear to my heart. I just finished a book recently on it called The Castle on Sunset by Sean Levy. And it basically talks about the entire history of the Chateau Marmont on Sunset Boulevard, which if you've ever been on Sunset, it just sits on a hill overlooking Sunset. And it's in a very famous area of L.A. Um, uh, directly across the street and down the street a little bit uh, is the former location of Schwab's Pharmacy, where that's just a famous Hollywood hangout. And behind Schwab's was another hotel bungalow sort of a thing called the Garden of Allah, which has fascinating stories uh, on its own. So, And there's other things that happen in that area uh, when the when the riots came and the police were trying to clear the hippies out, all that took place right around there. Um, so yep. it's a very historic area and lots going on down there. But somehow the Chateau Marmont had survived multiple earthquakes. I guess when they built it, they foresaw the earthquake issue and, and uh, built it accordingly. And it survived multiple earthquakes. Wow. Um, it... It was dilapidated for a little while, but then it got restored. And and the funny thing is a lot of people who had stayed there was kind of disappointed with the restoration because they thought the fact that it was dilapidated kind of gave it character, which they thought was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, an amazing history at the Chateau. It was, uh, it was built in 1929, and they got the name uh, Chateau Marmont from the street that comes in off of Sunset uh, that goes around uh, to the entrance of, of the chateau and uh, into the neighborhoods in the back there. Um, they were toying with some other names and decided to go with the street that it's located on. It started out as an apartment building, but the Great Depression rolled around and they had a hard time uh, filling it with long-term residents. So, I was about to say, 1929, did it, it open in 29 or it started construction? It, it was completed in 29 and oh, opened wow. to the public, and what? then almost immediately after that Yikes. was the Great Depression. Really lousy timing on Fred Horowitz's uh, part. Uh, so he ended up selling the building in 1931, and it was converted into a hotel instead of an apartment building. And uh, like I said, it survived numerous earthquakes and scandals and all sorts of stuff. Uh, in 1942, it was purchased by German banker Erwin Brettauer. 
Um, and he was the first owner and apparently the first person in the area to allow black guests. In 1942? In 42. Wow, and, that's very open-minded of yeah, California, given yeah. what was going on at the time. <laughs> and so actors like Sidney Portier and and, uh, and actors of that ilk, they, they were welcomed with uh, open arms at the Chateau, Chateau which is amazing to well, me. Well, that's the other point of controversy, the fact that Germany. <laughs> then you're selling to a German yeah. banker. And I was like, huh. <laughs> he was a forward thinker. So, so yeah, that that was a really cool part of the story. Uh, mm. Years later, it was sold again to Raymond R. Sarlot and Carl Contergian. Um, in 1975, they performed major renovations to the building uh, while trying to retain its charm and history and the look. Uh, it was sold again and renovated again in 1990. Uh, it's been featured in, in many films. I just recently saw a film called Somewhere, which was, uh, I believe, written and directed by Sofia Coppola and shot entirely within uh, the Chateau, which is really cool. It, uh, the movie came out, I think, around 2010, and it gives you a really intimate look at the Chateau. There, there's scenes that are poolside and shot in the rooms and in the lobby, which I visited for the first time uh, last year in the spring of 2022, I just kind of pretended that I was a resident there. <laughs> so I walked up uh, Marmont Street and just kind of turned up the drive and walked into the lobby and no one said anything. And I sat down and sat in the lobby and was soaking up all the history and think, picturing all the people who came in and out of that uh, lobby. And this guy, I think he had like a tuxedo on. He approaches me, and I'm thinking, oh, he's going to kick me out. And he's like, can I get you something? And I was like, a Coke, my good man. <laughs> and uh, he came back with a Coke, and then I asked him for a, a matchbook. So he left, came back, gave me a matchbook that says Char Chateau Marmont on it. And nice. I see that same matchbook on eBay for like $35. So nice. this might be a minor point, too, but who got charged for the Coke? Oh, I pay, I oh, left okay. cash <laughs> on the table when I left. Yeah, yeah. I was like, put it, put it on my room. Yeah, uh, room, made 20, up some room. room 23. <laughs> so, um, and it also appeared in La La Land toward the end of the movie. Uh, uh, Emma Stone's character is living in the Chateau uh, and lots of other movies of film there. Um, just about anybody who was anybody in Hollywood lived or stayed at the Chateau uh, at some point throughout its history. I guess it was a favorite um place to go to for actors who were going to LA from New York. Like they were part of the New York theater scene. They got recruited from the stage to appear in Hollywood films. And when they would come to LA, they felt at home at the Chateau. They just felt comfortable there. And here are just some of the names of some of the people who stayed there. Bogart, Errol Flynn, David Niven, John Barrymore, John Wayne, uh, Greta Garbo, who would uh, registered under a pseudonym, Marilyn Monroe stayed there. Uh, Jean Harlow, who was at the Chateau on her honeymoon with another guy, conducted an affair with Clark Gable while she was on her honeymoon at the Chateau. <laughs> oh, dirty. Interesting. Dirty. Uh, Betty Davis supposedly fell asleep with a lit cigarette, started a fire. <laughs> Damn it, uh, Betty. <laughs> Columbia Pictures rented Suite 54 for its stars to stay out of the media spotlight. Uh, William Holden, Glenn Ford stayed there under. Let's the dub, let's dub it the Fixer's Delight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and that was the thing. That's one of the reasons why the Chateau was so popular with stars is they kind of banned the press, and so they were secluded. These stars were secluded. People would bathe nude by the pool and not worry about paparazzi snapping photos and stuff. So, a lot was going on at the Chateau or something. But yeah, you know, it makes sense. It's a private, it's a private property, so yes. Yeah. And the staff was told to be discreet and look the other way. So really, really inter interesting history. Uh, we've mentioned on the podcast before, uh, director Nicholas Ray rented Bungalow One for eight years. And while he was there, he worked on Rebel Without a Cause. And uh, the staff and crew or the cast and crew would go to his bungalow to do read-throughs. And he had to fare with a 16-year-old Natalie Wood at the time. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. Uh, modern stars who've stayed there include Michelle Pfeiffer, Keanu Reeves, Johnny Depp, Leo DiCaprio, 
rock stars like Billy Idol, Jim Morrison, Led Zeppelin stayed there. There's a there's a story that uh, Jim Morrison dangled from a balcony or something and fell and hurt himself and got addicted to the painkillers that eventually took his life. Oh, boy. Um, so, yeah, uh, Lindsay Lohan rang up a $46,000 tab uh, during her 47-night stay in room 33 and was asked to leave. I read that she <laughs> she made good on most of the bill, but I don't yeah. know if she ever settled it in its entirety. 47000 over 40. Yeah, it's running about a G a night. <laughs> yeah. Grand a night, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, there have been uh, a couple of deaths uh, on, on site. We're going to get to the most famous one in a second. But photographer Helmut Newton, uh, who was just a welcome uh, guest there. The staff loved him. Everybody loved him. He would uh, go there around Christmas time and stay there for months. And uh, everyone just absolutely loved him. And apparently while coming out of the under, underground garage, he was coming out of the drive, and he I guess he, like, accelerated and crashed into a wall, and they found his dead body in his car. And the the autopsy pretty much revealed that as he was exiting the hotel, he had a heart attack and crashed into the, the wall and, oh, and died. Um, I saw pictures. I haven't seen it myself, but I've seen pictures that on the wall where he impacted, there's a little plaque that says Helmut Newton and his, his years on it. Um, so that was one death, but, uh, a lot of people weren't aware of the Chateau Marmot and myself included until a very famous death that had happened there. Uh, in bungalow three, John Belushi died of a drug overdose on March 5th, 1982 at the age of 33. Uh, yeah, we, we, we have talked about that. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, around noon on the 5th, Trainer and bodyguard Bill Wallace arrived at Bungalow 3 to deliver a typewriter and audio cassette recorder and found Belushi dead. Uh, six days later, it was announced that the cause of death was a lethal combination of cocaine and heroin, also known as a speedball. Uh, on his last night, he was visited by Robin Williams, who did drugs with him that night, Robert De Niro, who was a friend of his, and a woman named Kathy Smith. Now, here's the, this is really odd. So, Kathy Smith later admitted during an uh, interview with the National Enquirer that she had injected Belushi with the speedball. So, mm. she was arrested and charged with murder. Uh, but I've never heard that. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Now, here's the weird <laughs> thing. On the day of Belushi's death, she was arrested at the Chateau uh, in Belushi's rented red Mercedes because she was driving the wrong way into the one-way exit, which oh. I assume is the same exit that Helmut Newton died in. But she was arrested for that, but they didn't connect her to Belushi right away, which is odd that she was arrested for something completely unrelated to the fact that Belushi was laying there dying <laughs> that evening, which is so crazy to me. Um, but after admitting in the interview that she had uh, administered the lethal injection, she was arrested. She was charged with murder, but she remained free for four years while her attorneys plea bargained and asked for stays. Um, eventually, it went to trial, and she was convicted and jailed after they talked it down to involuntary manslaughter charges. She was only jailed for 15 months. Uh, for the death of John Belushi and released. I wonder at Chateau Marmont if the the uh, staff are told after after the Belushi uh, tragedy, anytime we have a guest, quote unquote guest in air in, in air quotes, knock on the door every couple hours. Yeah, right. Just just check on them. Yeah, because housekeeping. Yeah, you know, <laughs> because it, it's that fine line between you like the they all go to the Marmont for discretion. The staff is doesn't betray them to the paparazzi. Mm -hmm. and so. Now, one thing I really enjoy is the is Google Earth. And when I visited the Chateau, I kind of walked around the building, and there's sort of an alley that goes behind the property and then comes out on the street. And if you search for John Belushi crime scene photos or whatever you want to call them, the Bungalow 3 was near this back gate, and so the ambulance, the coroner, I guess, had 
brought the ambulance up to this gate and there's photos of Belushi covered in a sheet that were exiting that gate. And if you go on Google earth, the cameras will actually take you down that alleyway and you can line up the shot exactly with this photograph that someone had taken of Belushi wow. on a gurney. And you see the same buildings in the background. Oh, you do the street view thing. When yeah. Yeah, exactly. That. Where you go down to the street and you can see the same buildings in the background. And it's, I love just sort of walking around using Google earth and visiting famous locations and uh, some of these other locations that are going to be coming up today. It's like your own um, version of Pokemon go. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but it's, it's really neat to like, you know, like we talked about uh, the the one actress who owned a restaurant and then she died in uh, a garage. Remember that? The car. Right, right. Uh, I'm trying to recall her name. I'm drawing a blank. But you can, like, see that garage on, on Google Earth. It's still standing today. And so there's very historical landmarks in L.A. that you can visit via Google Earth, which is kind of fun in a morbid way, I guess. Now, here's, here's the segue to our next... Uh, location uh another famous resident or residents of the chateau was a newlywed couple named roman polanski and sharon tate oh boy and uh they stayed at the chateau as newlyweds and then sharon tate got pregnant and they said well this is no place to raise a baby so they rented an address at 10050 cielo drive oh dear uh in benedict canyon and you guys obviously are one step ahead of me you know where i'm going with this <laughs> I have um, a bad feeling about that <laughs> <laughs> so this house at 10050 cielo drive was built in 1944 for french actress michelle morgan and included a main house and a guest house dr hartley dewey bought the house and rented it to actress lillian gish in 1946 which i did not know and then it was purchased by Rudolf Altobelli of music and uh, film industry talent manager. Uh, he bought the house in the early 1960s and rented it out to stars like Cary Grant and Diane Cannon, uh, Henry Fonda, George Shakiris, who I met uh, a year or so ago. He was in West Side Story. He's a dancer. And he was in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes with Marilyn Monroe. He was a dancer on stage with Marilyn nice. Monroe. I had no idea that he had lived in that uh, notorious house. Where, uh, Joe, uh, was it you that was that showed me the layout of that of Cielo Drive and all those houses that are built up in the hills? Yeah. Just the narrow, oh sure, winding streets. Yeah. And I wonder when they built that. I was like, is this meant to kill Hollywood celebrities? Because <laughs> they're all going to drink or do drugs, and then you and have a one lane. Go these wi- going, yeah. And there's uh, sheer drop offs. Sheer stops. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is this designed to kill people? I, I, I <laughs> distinctly remember from. Uh, the Tarantino movie, how curvy yeah. uh, that neighborhood was. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Think, I think you might have shown me a Google Earth of it. I went, this is this is madness. <laughs> oh, I've driven those roads and I oh get anxiety. <laughs> I have a fear of heights, so. Um, but yeah, I get anxiety driving those roads. They're twisty, curvy, and don't. If someone was like angry and they stormed out in a rage and they were speeding down these streets. You wouldn't see them coming around the corner and smash right in. And you. now these days, just the distracted driving, looking at their exactly. phone. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. scary. Yeah, yeah. Thank God. Um, and getting injected by s- speedballs, you know. Well, then there's <laughs> that too. The more traditional They trip routes. and fall and uh, <laughs> inject you with it. Um, now, a- after this list of celebrities that have rented the house, um, Terry Melcher, who was the son of Doris Day, uh, was... I believe dating Candace Bergen and they occupied the house uh, from May, 1966 to January, 1969. Murphy Brown lived there? Yes. I, yes. Murphy oh. Brown, Candace Bergen. Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> I should know her real name. I do know her, real name, but I just, wow. That, Murphy Brown. that fact just like really uh, <laughs> stuck in there. Yeah. Nick, you're going to go down a rabbit hole tonight. That's right. They've done a couple already. Now, for those of you listening who haven't made the connection yet, <laughs> while Terry Melcher and Candace Bergen were living in the house, they were visited by a aspiring musician named Charles Manson Ooh. in 1968. Wow. And that might be the reason why his minions visited later. Yeah. Um, now, luckily for Terry Melcher and Candace Bergen, they moved out when they broke up and moving in after they moved out was Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate, 
who began running the house in February of 1969. Then, just a few months later, on August 8th, going into the 9th, 1969, uh, Tate, um, now Roman Polanski was out of town. I think he was doing a movie overseas. Um, but Tate and her friends, including Abigail Folger, hairstylist Jay Sebring, um, and uh, they were murdered by Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, and Patricia Cranwinkle. Now, William Gerritsen lived in the guest house and slept through the whole ordeal. Oh, he wasn't the guy who had the flamethrower at the end? No, no. Oh, <laughs> no. no. Oh. Is, uh, you're mixing fact and fiction. <laughs> oh. Um, but yeah, imagine waking up the next morning and you see police and lights and commotion and you're like, what happened? And he was questioned by police and he was like, I had no idea. That, that, that reminds me, uh, remember the recent, uh, Idaho college uh, yeah. students here were yeah. killed. Yeah. There were, I think two people in that house who said they slept through the whole thing. Well, there's one woman who saw the killer yeah. leave. They came face that's, to face. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I walked yeah. right past her or something. Yeah. Not sure. We're going to find out all the sort of details of that I, I didn't when it want goes to, to trial. I didn't want to go off too much of a tangent, but that reminded me of yeah. it. And think about how extremely traumatic. Yeah. You're going to be in therapy the rest of your life. Oh, well, sure. so the interesting you thing about, about what you're seeing for the Tate, the, uh, the Manson Massacre, how far is that? Did they ever show, like, how far is the guest house? Because was it? He didn't hear the gunshots. He didn't hear the screaming, yeah. the commotion. They said it. The guest house was behind the main house. I don't know what the distance is, but you, when you'd the, have to look it up on Google. Well, they're go, those homes are gone now. Those oh, were demolished. They were demolished. Okay. Yeah, and we'll get to that in a second. So you can't see what the distance is today, but there's probably archival photos out there that sure. can give you an idea. Um, now, three weeks after the murders, and I think we've mentioned on past podcasts that when. Polanski came back to the house. He brought a photographer with him, like a Life magazine photographer who shot photos of him cleaning the blood off the doors oh. and stuff, which is crazy to me. Um, but three weeks after the murders, the original owner who was renting the building out, Alto Belli, um, moved into the house and lived there until 1988 because he, oh. did, he couldn't rent it to anybody else, so he lived there until 88. Wow. Um, yeah, I then, uh, that's another famous connection, Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails rented the house in 1992, uh, set up a recording studio there working on the album The Downward Spiral. I, I was just going to say Downward Spiral. <laughs> yeah, and they shot a music video there, which I, I haven't seen, but uh, there's a, a music video for the song Gave Up was filmed there. Wow. And Marilyn Manson recorded tracks for a Portrait of an American Family in 1992 <laughs> in that house. All right. Now I, I saw an interview with Reznor, uh, just a you know a text interview, um, but he was confronted by the daughter of the victims. I'm trying to remember the details, but she made him feel really really dirty for not just living in the house, but like exploiting it. He and kind of capitalized on it. He made. A lot of money from that album. Yeah. So and, I and can, I can. He had an I epiphany when she confronted him. He felt really dirty and said, "Okay, this is wrong." And he never thought of the the victims and the people that were involved. But wow. this here's a weird twist. When he, he kept moved, money. well, that too. <laughs> but that's not the only thing he kept. When he moved out of the house, he took the front door with him, and had the front door installed at his studio in New Orleans. Which is so odd. See, that's how you transfer bad luck. Yeah, yeah. Bad, bad juju. <laughs> Especially going to New Orleans. Yeah. Yeah. That city is cursed as it is. Right. And so <laughs> when when that studio got sold, the front door was left behind, and an artist named Christopher Moore worked out a deal with the current owner of the building to buy the front door, and it's in his private collection right now. So that, that door that said uh, pigs or something on it, written in blood, that is out there somewhere in New Orleans, which is so crazy. Um, like I said, the house was demolished in 1994. The guest house was demolished, too. And a brand-new home was built on the grounds uh, and given a new address. The new address is 10066 Cielo Drive. Uh, when I was out there in 2019, my friends and I were doing a uh, our own little tour of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And the scenes uh, where, where uh, Brad Pitt's character comes down this drive and makes a sharp turn and he 
gas as it takes off. Yep. That's the actual Cielo Drive where this house used to reside. But my friends and I drove up that road and we got to this gated off portion oh. that we were sort of peeking through, but you couldn't get past the gate. Um, so you can't even really see what's there now from, from foot. Um, but yeah, so it's a brand new place there, new address. Um, so they, they did film scenes on Cielo drive with, with Brad Pitt, but the house that's depicted as the Tate Polanski house and the Rick Dalton house that was filmed at a completely different location. One zero nine six nine Alta view drive in studio city. And what's kind of fun is you can drive right up to that house. It looks exactly like it did in the movie, Rick Dalton's house. There's even a little intercom in the big gate where Rick is talking to Sharon Tate on the intercom and then he's invited in. So that all exists exactly like it does in the movie. Unfortunately, the movie had a much happier ending than real <laughs> yes. life. Yes. But if you're a fan of Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you could film or you could visit many, many locations that were used in the film, including Rick's house. And I mean, he's trying that. to have an uptick in happy endings. I mean, in Glorious Bastards, you shoot yeah, Hitler in the chase. face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When I saw Glorious Bastards, I'm like, I don't remember that in the history books. Is that how it happened? So yeah, I didn't realize he had this revisionist. Uh, way of yeah. making movies or whatever but that's ex and so i was kind of ex i don't want to say i was expecting it but when he did do the revisionist spoiler alert um ending for the movie i was kind of relieved because i didn't really want to see it played out on screen yes. how it happened in real life that would have been really really brutal i i completely agree yep. yeah two great great movies yeah so notorious locations and um i'm going to do a third one and then we'll kind of go around the table here um, in, uh, the area there, uh, sort of in Brentwood, uh, Los Angeles, uh, at 875 South Bundy Drive, there's a 3,400 square foot, three-story townhouse, four bedrooms, four bathrooms, three fireplaces, and a rooftop sun deck that sounds like mm. paradise. Nice. Um, cool. On January of 1994, a woman named Nicole Brown Simpson moved into that townhouse uh, with her two children. And then... I'm trying to uh, place the name. <laughs> <laughs> She's married to Homer. Uh, ah, no. Uh, the timeline of the events on Sunday, June 12, <clears throat> 1994, uh, at 6.30 p.m., Nicole, her children, and some other family members, including Nicole's mother, went to dinner at Mezzaluna Restaurant which is about an 11-minute walk from the house, the townhouse. Uh, they leave the restaurant at 8 p.m. They stop for ice cream. Uh, at 9.15, uh, the restaurant gets a call saying that Nicole's mother had left her glasses behind. So the owner found the glasses and said, who can take these over to this address? And a waiter named Ron Goldman said, I'll do it. <sighs> Man. The volunteer. Uh, yeah. Uh, at around 9.50 uh, p.m., Goldman leaves the restaurant with a white envelope containing the glasses. Uh, Nicole had drawn a bath, uh, was eating a bowl of ice cream. Uh, the TV was on. Her two children were asleep inside the townhome. And whoever was outside, she apparently willingly opened the door to meet with whoever this was. Would she have done that with a total stranger? I don't know. Unlikely. Um, but as we all know, she was brutally, brutally murdered outside her townhome. Uh, she was almost decapitated by a knife and poor, unfortunate Ron Goldman more than likely showed up at the absolute wrong time, saw what was going on, tried to break it up. And he was also killed uh, on the front of that property as well. Um, so that evening, Sunday, June 12th, uh, she was 35 years old. Nicole Brown Simpson was stabbed to death outside her home with 25 year old waiter, Ron Goldman. Uh, the bodies were discovered shortly after midnight when, uh, Nicole's dog, her, uh, Akita, I think it's called, was, was crying and whining and, and like led people to the home where they discovered the, the bodies that night. Uh, she had been stabbed 12 times, nearly decapitated, like I said, had defense wounds on her hands. Goldman 
was stabbed 25 times during a lengthy fight, and they found him with his shirt pulled over his head and the glasses in the envelope laying on the property. Um, now, when I was out in L.A. in 2011, a friend of mine wanted to come with me. Uh, he had never been to L.A. Now he lives out there. I'm a little jealous. Um, but when we got out there, I said, uh, what do you want to visit? Like, I've seen everything. What do you want to see? And he goes, I want to see the Simpson murder site. I'm like, really? All right, let's go. So we went to 875 South Bundy Drive, and it's it's unrecognizable now. Okay. Apparently, the, the townhome sat vacant for a number of years, and then when the new owners came in, for reasons that are obvious, they totally changed the outside of the townhome. The entrance was moved. The address was changed. And if you look at that location on Google Maps, you wouldn't even know that there was a structure there because it's completely obscured by growth, by plants and trees and shrubbery. You, you can't even see a structure behind it. As a matter of fact, when I was looking at it on Google Earth, I, I remember thinking, is this it ne- you know next to it? And then I realized, no, there's a uh, house you're, you're behind the, the street. Greenery. What about the overhead satellite view? Yeah, so you can see it uh, on on from the air, right. and you can also go around back to the alley where you see the the addresses. But they did change the address. It's no longer eight seven five. I think it's eight seven seven, which is weird because the the addresses don't go in order now. Like I think the the one next to it was like eight seven three. Then it goes eight seven something i don't know but it kind of changes the order of the addresses but just um, like they had to do with the the manson yeah yeah they right. changed yeah like they <laughs> want to you know they don't want to discourage the looky yes, loos and right. not have people swarm in the property even though anyone use, can find it anyway. if you use your google maps yeah. you're gonna know where it is you're gonna so know what's going an, on unof- this is officially an unsolved murder well, <laughs> sort of. Let's get into the evidence, <laughs> shall we? Um, and this is what was shocking, because there's theories out there that maybe he didn't do it, that maybe it was a drug deal gone wrong, because apparently Nicole had a habit. Uh-huh. Um, there, was a, there was a theory out there that O.J.'s son had been involved somehow. But as I was researching this, I, I saw the list of evidence, and I'm like, oh, geez, there's... There's no way anybody else did it. So basically, OJ's blood was found at the murder scene. No questions asked. Like, his yeah. blood was found as they picked up samples of blood and tested it. They had a match for OJ. You would think, okay, that's that's enough. It's usually a red flag. His uh, hair and, wait, blood, hair, and fibers from uh, Nicole and Ron Goldman were found in Simpson's car and at his home. Mm-hmm. Now, how would Ron Goldman's DNA get yeah. in his vehicle and in his home? The famous bloody gloves. You remember the bloody gloves? Yep. One was left at the crime scene. The second was found on his property. <laughs> but the defense attorneys were trying to suggest that it was planted by these racist cops that yeah. screwed everything up. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the famous Bruno Mali uh, shoe prints. There were bloody shoe prints at the crime scene that matched shoes that Simpson had been photographed wearing but had misplaced when the police had asked for them. He's like, I don't know what I, I had with those. I knew all the other evidence. I hadn't heard the, the footprints. Yeah. Okay, interesting. He, he denied ever owning a pair. He, he said they were in poor taste or something. And then <laughs> a, a sports photographer found a picture of O.J. Simpson wearing those exact of shoes. Course. Of course. Did O.J. have any wounds on him? Did they were inspect him to see where well, the Well, do you remember the from? broken glass? He They said, how'd you cut your hand? And he said, oh, I, I broke a glass in the sink. So he did have uh, a wound uh, that was... Yeah, it was- Either Nicole or uh, the other guy, they they, fought. they were they they were gonna go, <laughs> but you're not gonna overpower what? OJ OJ yeah, I, former I, athlete. Yeah, I don't remember what position he played, but running back. He, he was a running, running back. back. Yeah. But, I mean, the juice was a power runner. He had speed and power. He, he yeah. yeah, he's a Heisman Trophy winner. Yeah. <laughs> so, so of course, um, they held a funeral for Nicole, which was atten- attended by OJ Simpson, their children. And Al Cowlings of the famous White Bronco Chase and Cato Kalin. Uh, he was tried for the murders of both Brown and Goldman. The trial lasted nine months, and in October of 1995, 
as we all know, he was shockingly acquitted. Uh, you know, if, if the glove don't fit, we must well, acquit. Johnny Cochran. Yeah. So he was acquitted of murder charges, but then in 1997, uh, Fred Goldman, the father of Ron, uh, filed uh, civil uh, charges. Uh, so there was a civil trial which found him liable for the wrongful deaths. Um, I, I assume during a, a civil trial, you're allowed to look at evidence that might not be considered during a murder trial. Uh, I, I, I would, I would guess, I would guess so. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the Goldman family was awarded thirty-three million dollars in damages, which, in a, a roundabout way, led to Simpson getting jailed later for armed robbery. <laughs> when he was trying to retrieve his sports memorabilia yeah. at a Las Vegas hotel. And I remember that. Yeah. yeah. That was extremely funny. And That's, that was so, so crazy. And just embarrassing for him. Well, also, the man had written a book. <laughs> yes, I if, was going to mention If it. I did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I did. I was like, this is something out of a Mel Brooks comedy. Yeah, yeah it's like, how shameless yeah. do you ha- that That's... That's so shameless and brazen. And uh, let me ask you, how much, uh, money did make, how many millions did he make off the book to pay off? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, every every penny he made was was garnished uh, to to go to the Goldman family. Good. All, all the naked gun money. Yeah, Good. and all his sports mem- memorabilia, anything that was auctioned off was going to go to the Goldman family. Good. And Good for you them. know, I'll, I'll never forget a line. I think it was on Saturday Night Live, but it might have been one of the talk show hosts, but. When O.J. got arrested in Vegas, they were like, wait, let me get this straight. He was arrested for it, and then they just stopped and said, for murder. He, he was arrested for murder. Come on. Like, it was the consequences of his actions that led to him actually going to jail. But he, he didn't spend a whole lot of time in jail. He, he spent a relatively short amount of time in jail, and now he's juices on loose. He's out there doing uh, living I, life, looking I, for the real killers. I remember uh, seeing online randomly – Someone had uh, t- taken a video of him at Costco shopping, wow. and I'm like, "This is so." What would you say to so OJ at Costco? Sur- would you say something to him? Would you go, "Hey, what up, OJ?" Or <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. How do you approach him? Did you ever ask to be traded from Buffalo? <laughs> <laughs> can you uh, can you sign this? Can you sign the visor of my white Bronco? <laughs> Man, uh, it's great. I don't know what I would say to him if I saw him in I, person. I'm, I'd, I'm sure you That's can find wild. it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Do you regret not winning a Super Bowl? <laughs> what was Leslie regrets? Nielsen like in behind the scenes? Yeah. <laughs> now, I do remember uh, reading somewhere, and now this is hearsay, and I don't know if I can validate this, but do you remember there's a former football player named uh, Rosie Greer who had become a pastor, and he was O.J.'s pastor, and there's – a rumor out there that O.J. had confided in Rosie Greer that he had committed the murders. But um, that's, like I said, that's hearsay that's kind of floating around out there. But hmm. um, So those are the three major locations that I was bringing up today. I have another one that if we have time I'll mention at the end of the podcast. But, Nick, what do you uh, what you bring to the table today? Me? I unfortunately got sent down the uh, – I'm, I'm outside of L.A. now with, my, with the topic I'm bringing up. I got sent down the Amityville rabbit hole and boy oh hottie that was that was something to that was an interesting thing now it was the site of a crime scene and there were ho- multiple hollywood movies done on it so technically my topic does fit the criteria let's Very let's lucid. separate fact from fiction first what yeah. actually happened at the amityville house? yeah so the the facts are this there was a tragic brutal mass murder that occurred in 1974 november by ronald defeo uh, the DeFeos were an Irish Catholic family. They bought the house there. It was a very, you know, Ronald had a very troubled life. Uh, he was the eldest son of five. And uh, so one night uh, after apparently having an argument and drinking and, you know, just he snapped. And he took a shotgun or a thirty five caliber uh, rifle and shot all of his family, both parents, both younger brothers, both younger sisters. So there were four murders on site? Uh, uh, six. Six, total. six. Oh, yeah, two, 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 two boys, parents. two girls, and the parents. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. My math, math's yeah. not my strong suit. <laughs> four siblings, two parents. So he murdered them. He shot them all and then realized what had he done, went to a local bar, tried to figure out what had happened, and then tried to pass off multiple things. And then, hey, I think it was a mafia hit that had done it. You know, you know, your, your 
Italian Catholic. Sorry, I, I meant I meant I said Irish. I'm an Italian Catholic, so they were like, "Oh, could have been mafia." I'm like, "Well, that's stereotypical." Yeah, <laughs> make that leap. Yeah. So what happened was, he gets arrested. They finally realize his alibis don't work out. He's charged with murder. He goes to trial, and during the defense, they say that uh, they, his def- or att- attorneys argue that he was possessed. He's insane, mm. so he, he can't be tried for that. But they said, "Well, no, he's not really insane. This seems like he, we're, we're, he's getting convicted. So he got six consecutive life sentences. He died in 2021 mm. at the age of 69 in prison, mm. but he was adamant that he was n- possessed." Like he was possessed by demons, it was the devil that made him do it, and all that stuff. But people said, "Okay, all right, let's let's try and investigate this." Uh, a month later, or not, or not a year later, the families, the Lutz family, moves in. George and Kathy Lutz and their and their and their children, and they know the history of the house. The house was sold for eighty thousand dollars, which was a bargain at the time. Around it was a beautiful house, too. Yeah. My yeah. God, it was a Dutch colonial and built in nineteen twenty four. Because the the real house that exists looks like the one in the film, right? Yes. It has they, that they made, same, that, and that that house is in New Jersey, the wow. one in the film. But they yeah. made they made it a point to look for something along that style. Yeah, and it's a and it's a lovely suburban neighborhood. You know, the there was a, the neighbors never had an issue. So, the Lutz family moves in, and they say from day one they started having problems, and they record a bunch of history of saying like, oh, you know, we're hearing things, we're not feeling well, and they document all these other, what would be considered paranormal things. The, so these, and the, and the fact is, after multiple incidents, they say, okay, in 20 days, we're leaving. On the 20th day, whatever happened that night, they said they woke up, they experienced a night of terror, and that morning, they took the clothes on their back, and they left the house, and they abandoned it. And they wouldn't go back in, uh, they they left a lot of their possessions there. About a month or so later, they had reporters came in and they brought in a bunch of parapsychologists, psychics, mediums to try and investigate what was going on because this is this house and it has a history of it that's not been in the press not too long ago. And these guys are now creating a story about, hey, I think there's something else going on here. Maybe that Ronald DeFeo guy was right about being possessed. And, and you have to keep in mind that the exorcist had come out in 1973 Omen mm-hmm. came out in nineteen was it would come out in nineteen seventy six, and uh, yeah. So, so who was behind the book? So the book came Jay, out first. What was yeah. the story behind the book? The book recorded the 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 accounts of the Lutz family and the twenty days of terror that they had there. And there was actually mm-hmm. a movie. There there been multiple adaptations of movies. It's called Twenty Days Later, or not Twenty Days Later, <laughs> but Twenty <laughs> Days. You know, well, Amityville Horror yeah. was the one that came out. What in the get yeah, no. Late 1979. Yeah, okay. So late yeah. 70s. That had uh, and James Brolin of, in it yep. and, uh, and uh, Margot Kidder. Yeah, Margot Kidder. Believe. Those are the two big ones. Yeah. And that movie took extreme liberties that even George Lutz <laughs> and, and his wife were like, oh, that never happened. Like the flies attacking the priest. Yeah. If you guys ever see the movie, it, it, it's, it definitely falls under horror. And there were skeptics that said these guys are just making it up. They, uh, the neighbors were convinced that this family saw what happened in the press, wanted to move into this house. And had a plan to orchestrate all these, mm. you know. Oh my, you know the what Kathy Lutz would said. I felt ill. George Lutz said I woke up and my wife was all of a sudden ninety years old and levitating off the bed, and my daughter was seeing this imaginary pig with oh, red yeah. eyes, and the dog tried to hang himself on day one by jumping <laughs> over the fence. Oh, the priest was saying that he he went up there because they you know they wanted to have they heard of the story, so they brought a priest and the priest said I heard someone say get out. Mm. on the top bedroom and they said don't ever and told them don't ever stay there and so we said okay we didn't stay there we just turned to a sewing room like, okay yeah mm. probably don't even go to the room but so all these evidence all these incidents were documented and he would keep getting about 315 which is about the time that the the murders the mur- murders occurred now this is where you know we're talking about fact and fiction we we're talking about this all uh before the episode started when ronald defeo murdered and, and fired the shots so there were nine shots. Thirty-five cal, uh, thirty-five rifle, caliber rifle makes a loud, a, a loud, loud sound. They, mm-hmm. they were doing friends of like you could hear that five blocks away. Nine shots. Neighbors heard nothing, and the re- neighbors said, "I ne- we never heard a gunshot. Hmm. O- only heard the dog barking between three and three thirty. Hmm. That's the neighbor, the the, the Defeo's dog. Hmm. When the when they were murdered, all the victims were laying face down in the bed, 
no defensive wounds. Autopsy said there was no evidence of drugs and the bodies were not moved. So this guy, Ron DeFeo, walked up, shot his parents first. As the they slept. Basically. As they slept. Nobody woke up, hmm. walked to the, his brother's room, shot them both, then walked to the sister's room and shot them. And nobody moved, no defensive wounds, no signs of being held against their, you know, someone, maybe there were multiple people. They were saying, had to be multiple people. Hmm. Someone held them down, but no bruising, no defensive wounds, uh. no other fibers. So, hmm. you know, that's when we were talking about the Sharon Tate murders. I, I was wondering how far, you know, say how did no one hear? Right. But right, in this right. particular, you know, in Sharon Tate's case, he could have been drunk or high off his butt. We don't know. Hmm. It's Hollywood. And they were partying. Here, these are kids. And yeah. the fact that no neighbors heard it. Now, what they were trying to say is that night, um, there was a DEA agent observing the house. Why? Hmm. Yeah, but that's also in one of the, in the, in the re- news report documentaries. Okay. And the DEA agent said, I remember seeing a woman coming out with a hood and wearing black gloves and holding a rifle. <laughs> and Ronald DeFeo's defense says that a demon wearing a hood and black hands, but wearing gloves because he was drunk or high off the time, mm. handed him a gun and told him to kill his family. Mm. So they are thinking that Dawn, one of his sisters, was the actual orchestrator of the killing. Re- and when he realized her, when she realized her elder brother was too much of a you know drunk and wasn't ready for that night, she went and did it. Mm. And then he realized what happened and he killed her. But they were like, okay, and then what happens? So the DA agent's like, well, then we tail, we tail the 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 figure, hooded figure lady to the dock where they did find the guns later on when hmm. the rifle that was used in the murder when they were, were they looking thrown for the in the weapon. lake or no, no, no. I Just, think it was by the dock. Okay. It wasn't actually in the lake. I've never heard that part. Okay. Yeah, and so, but my thing is, if you're a DA agent, you didn't hear nine blasts. Yeah. Or you didn't hear eight blasts go off. You didn't. Hear, that's not probable cause to be like, hey, is that a gunshot? I should probably go in. I'm a yeah. DA agent. Nothing. So that's huh. a fact that the skeptics used to say, well, it's not, he wasn't possessed and maybe there was something else going on here. Mm-mm. Now, the interesting thing is a criminologist, when it came to the court for Ron DeFeo, they had a the closed um, closed meeting with the judge. They, they asked everyone to leave. And the criminologist was adamant that uh, there was evidence that the bodies were moved and that they had to have been drugged. But yeah, that flies to, in the face that, of the autopsy. You know, that makes... That makes sense, though. I mean, if it, they hear all these sh- these rifle blasts and not react to them, something had to have knocked them out. Yeah. All of them shot the same way. All of them face down, mm. as if none of them moved. But you mm. said in the autopsies, there's no the, evidence. The of autopsy any... was at the 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 coroner was adamant. Mm. No drugs were involved, and wow. the, and the the forensics people that were there said this, there was no evidence that the body was moved. Mm. So they're saying that, but another criminologist who asked the entire courtroom to be cleared and spoke to the judge and lawyers in private says no testifies otherwise saying no they, the bodies were moved so why would you do that hmm. i would feel like you say no you guys are wrong and i'm going to back put my my scientific background against your scientific background and see who which one of us is wrong i'm saying two plus two is four you're saying two plus two is fish <laughs> so, yeah so you have two different uh, experts right. contradicting each other. Contradicting each other. Which one? And that's the thing. They uh, And when I was doing <sighs> looking it up, how come these two never talk? Because then, the like I said, the neighbors are saying, listen, we think that George and Kathy, who moved in later, ginned all this up to make a hoax. But they're saying, we still never heard gunshots. And they're like, hmm. so, okay, put the George and George and Kathy Lutz family who are trying to build this up and make a deal with the Ronald DeFeo's lawyer, Weber, kind of was had a meeting with them. And they were trying to say, hey, you know, he's like, hey, look, this is what happened. Okay, so if they're, let's say it's it's pure capitalism and greed. They want to make a movie and, cap- and sensationalize it. Sure. But when we, you talk about the facts, Joe, how did you not hear the gunshots? Yeah. And they showed, and then they fired that rifle. They're like, oh, my God, I'm going to go deaf. I'm like, yeah, you can hear that five blocks away. Next door neighbor, it's literally like a hmm. like your neighbor about 20 feet away. You could throw a football and hit their house. They never heard it. Hmm. multiple shots and then the DEA agent saying well the house is under investigation well why was Ronald DeFeo now this starts to go into the whole mafia thing why is the DEA agent there saying that he was uh, it was under observation so are, are you suggesting that the the family may have been murdered elsewhere and and moved to the house is that the conclusion you're drawing from this well here's my my I'm a skeptic uh, let's get that clear to the audience I'm obviously you have to make me make me believe in vampires werewolves oh, ghosts, demons, all yeah. that stuff 
and it's your job to convince me. My problem is that on the skeptic side, the facts don't aren't jiving with each other, and I don't know why that part has never been cleared up. Why hasn't one said, no, you know what, take your criminology degree and flush it down the toilet because you don't know what you're talking about, hmm. which is true. There are people who were... I mean, look, Michael Jackson's doctor said, oh, I didn't think this would happen to him. Like, you're a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> like, you gave him drugs and you were surprised that he, I'm shocked, shocked that he died. <laughs> you know, take, throw that MD off your name. I mean, so people who are professionals make mistakes. It's, yeah. I am completely okay with that. But this is not, this wasn't just last year. This has been going on for years now. How come yeah. none of this has ever been cleared up? And that's my problem. The, the other part is when you guys have heard of The Conjuring. The movies we're coming yeah. up in spooky season. Mm -hmm. So, part of what in, uh, the Channel Five News of the local area did was they invited parapsychologists and and, par and uh, paranormal investigators, psychics, mediums, and all of them. And so they brought a bunch of them together. Ed, Ed, Ed and Lorraine Warren were one of them. And now their documentation, they brought TV crews to do something like listening and audio. Did the whole shebang like you, you've seen in some of the movies? If you guys ever see, they they are very they try to be very thorough because they know people are going to poke fun of them and say they're charlatans, which is fine. I don't know how much I'm not tech savvy, but in 1976, I don't know much about photoshopping. They set up. There's this one instance that people have not been explained yet. They're trying to now. They, Lorraine Warren said, I felt evil. I, I could see images. Okay, I can't prove that. Ed Warren said he got pushed back physically, and the report is like, it sounded like they were reacting to it. I didn't feel anything. I didn't know anything, but I'm not of that world. But the psychic was like, I remember throwing holy water and hearing the hiss of, of, of heat mm -hmm. as if there's stuff in there. But they did take a picture in the hallway that showed all the bedrooms and the doors, like when you come up the stairway, you could see all the entrance of the doors. And it would just snap pictures, wrap, you know, because that's the whole point, because we're not always going to be watching, but the camera will keep snapping pictures until it runs out. And there was one picture that got snapped, and it shows the face of a little boy sticking his head out the room, and you see the, uh, the eyes glowing. And nobody, there was no children there. Mm. The, the news crew said there was not, no children that snuck in. The neighbors don't have children that would have snuck in there. Like, oh, hey, little Timmy snuck in. Because this is around 2.33 2 in the morning mm. when, this thing, when this picture was taken. So... And it's just this one solitary picture, and it's this little ghostly face looking out with the eyes on there. So you go, well, okay, what's that about? To be continued. Like, no one yeah. says, uh, I don't know. It has to be. It just, hmm. The rational brain says it has to be fake, which is fine. I'm still waiting for some skeptic to say, uh, no, we can figure out a way how to make this happen. And, hmm. you know, but. So yeah. what are your thoughts? What, not to, not considering the, the Lutz thing, but the, the Fayo murders. Yeah. Is this premeditated? Is it supernatural? Is it mob related? What conclusion did you mob come related? To? Because the D agent never saw anybody else come in and only saw someone exit out. And the person they think they saw exit out was the eldest daughter, Dawn. Yeah, and she was at the time wearing a hood and had gloves on because it was November. Maybe, mm -hmm. and, but okay, why didn't you stop her? Why didn't you be like, hey kid, yeah. where are you going? Is that a gun? Hmm. You, you didn't hear any guns. D agents. Doesn't say anything about guns, but then the criminologist report says bodies were moved, they were drugged. Yeah. So all the factual skeptic side, the facts don't agree. And so when that happens, then the believers say, "See, I told you." Yeah. The f skeptics can't even. Uh, so therefore, I'm right, <clears throat> which is like, no, you're not. Now you're gonna. You got me wanting to go home and start looking this yeah, stuff up. And I, I hope know. that's what this podcast does right. for our listeners: yes. is to no, I motivate just, you to get home and th start doing your own me research. Me too, because of, of course I've never. There, you there, know, seen couple, any of those movies. And there are a couple and, of good documentaries. And the, and then the people, like George Lutz said, I would wake up at 3.15. Well, you could have read that document on there and wait, you could subconsciously do that because when the 2005 remake was being made with Ryan Reynolds, a lot of the crew would wake up at 3.15 in the morning because they subconsciously read the story, heard the news reports, and now then they were like, I'm waking up at 3.15. Well, it's not because you're possessed. Yeah. Um, real quick, uh, what out of all those films related to the story, what would you suggest – Myself and our listeners who have not seen them to if take a, I, I would take watch a look the, at. I'd watch the original if you want to watch yeah. the fictional from, from part. The, yeah, from the, the 79, 79. The James Brolin version is, okay. is, in my opinion, one of the scariest movies ever made. Yes. Really? And yeah, it's terrifying. Wow. But, I mean, when you read later that, oh, maybe this was all fabricated, it, it kind of dampens the movie a little bit. But as a as a story that's compelling and, and, and interesting and scary, 
It's the movie's terrifying. Right. It really is. Okay. It was kind of at the time. It was kind of the standard, right up there with right. the Exorcist. And because and Omen at seventy six, Exorcist in seventy three. Yeah. So you were just running this ring of like horror. And you're like, oh my god, this is terrifying. And also, you kind of think the mood of, of the of the country at the time. Seventy nine, inflation was high before Reagan. And, you know the Iran Contra crisis, uh, you know hostage, uh, Iran hostage crisis was going on. You know everything was kind of down around that time, like seventy nine. So yeah. you had the vibe going on. People could relate to. Hey, I'm not even safe in my own home anymore. Yeah, kind of and stuff. Did, Eddie Murphy, I think, did a bit about a, a black family moving into yep. a haunted house. <laughs> oh, this is a lovely house. This is a beautiful house. Get out! Sorry, we can't stay. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame we can't stay. <laughs> out they go. No. So yeah, it was it was huge. I mean that that movie was huge at the and, time. And so even, that's the one I. And even that movie, okay. the screenwriter said, "Look, my job is to entertain. Yeah. I don't care about the true story and real fact. My job is to tell an entertaining story for you guys to go to the movie theater and watch." Sure. Jay Anson, the author of the book that was the film movie's based off, said when, they, when he was confronted by skeptics, he goes, I don't care. My job is to write something. He's, and he even told one of the skeptics, you're going to be penniless writing about your books that ghosts don't exist, and I'm going to be on a beach in, in the Caribbean <laughs> enjoying my ties <laughs> being wealthy. Unfortunately, yeah. Jay Anson, the author, died a little bit later of a heart attack, so he never got to enjoy the money mm. made off of it. Ah, karma. <laughs> we're uh, we're closing in on an hour, but we haven't got to uh, Andrew yet. Yeah, so, uh, Andrew, what'd yeah, you bring I, to the table? I, I, I don't have a, a a big story, but uh, it it uh, involves. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of the Winchester Mystery House. Out. I've heard of it. I've uh, did a little reading on it, and it's a okay. fascinating story. It's extremely fascinating. Um, so uh, just full disclosure, I visited there uh, when I was a kid. My aunt lived in the South Bay area, and oh, nice. uh, we got to go, and it was extremely fascinating. The grounds on the outside were immaculate. You know, you you could tell the whoever is in charge of it. The, I don't know if there are still Winchesters, like there are Rockefellers, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's 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 a beautiful place. And my sister became obsessed with it, and she mm. bought like like the books in the gift shop and everything, and and she. She could come on and, and talk an hour about it herself. But anyway, uh, just to give you some basic facts, uh, it was built by Sarah Winchester over the last, I, I believe, 35, 36 years of her life. She died in uh, 1922, just to give you a time frame. Uh, she l- lived for a while, I think, into her 80s, 83, I think. Um, now, was she the- was she... Married to the Winchester Gun family, or is she a descendant of the Winchester I, family? I, I believe she uh, she was the widow of William Wirt Winchester, and okay, I think okay. he was the guy who started it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So he yeah he started it, but anyway. Okay. So she was uh, what you would call a very eccentric person, um, and she was said to be haunted by. Either what she perceived to be the, the the souls of those who were killed by Winchester. Winchester. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. there was a certain sort of, I don't know, what would you call it, cognitive dissonance of growing up in this family, or sure. uh, marrying into this guy, being a multimillionaire. I don't know exactly how wealthy she was, but also just being haunted by this. But she would have uh, seances. She would have uh, crazy parties, uh, all sorts of just fan- fantastical things. But I just want to read a few facts about the, the building uh, so you can get a, a, a mental picture. It's 24,000 square feet. <laughs> oh, boy. 10,000 windows, 2,000 doors. Think about that. 2,000 2, doors. doors, 160 rooms. Oh, my God. 52 skylights, 47 stairways fireplaces many of which just go to nowhere yeah you know just a lot of nonsensical architecture so one of the easiest to break into houses that yeah <laughs> but if you break in there's no guarantee you're getting you, out you, you <laughs> yeah you ain't getting there's probably trap doors that we didn't even know about. <laughs> 17 chimneys 13 bathrooms and six kitchens and built at a price tag in 1923 dollars of five million which would be approximately 71 million Today. Oh boy! So now, what I had heard, this was over a long period of time because she kept adding and adding she kept and adding. adding. It was it was part of her eccentricity or whatever you want to call it. Maybe a little, you know, maybe she was a little off because she would build 
corridors and and like like we were saying uh doorways to nowhere yeah you'd open a door and there'd be a brick wall or right. yeah mrs right. winchester why the decoy chimney <laughs> and uh i know we don't have a whole lot of time left but after her death in uh uh i believe it was 1922 Someone who we spoke about uh, a while ago, a Mr. Harry Houdini, visited, mm. and he told the staff there, hey, you guys should try to promote this. And look what it t- turned and now into. And it's a tourist attraction. Now, what I had heard, and I don't know if you read the same thing, the reason that she had these false doors and hallways that led to nowhere is she, her goal was to confuse the ghosts, is what I had heard. I, I, that she I believe, wanted yes. ghosts to get lost in the house and leave her alone. It's, it's the reasoning that I had heard. I don't know if that's true or yes. not. But. And also, I had just come across this, uh, and it obviously wasn't a very popular movie, but in uh, just a couple years ago, five years ago, uh, Helen Mirren played her in a movie oh, called, I had no idea. called Winchester. Oh, boy. Ah. So... Oh. I gotta look that up. Who yeah. knows? Halimir is one of our our best actresses, but I had never heard of that, so might have to check if it's uh, streaming. And who knows? Maybe it's just one of those right. half decent movies that just nobody heard about. There's there's that Hollywood connection. There's that oh, Hollywood oh, return. One the Hollywood more connection. Yes. One more Hollywood connection. Apparently, this was this uh, house was the inspiration for the haunted mansion ride. Oh, in, for uh, Disney. For Disney. So interesting. They just came out with a with a movie, yeah, yeah which, I, which nobody Wilson saw. Movie. Yeah, yeah, it sort of <laughs> well, came and went. It's yeah. on. It's on my. It's on my list to see. I, I you know, I, I'm a big Lucky Stanfield uh, friend. So. God, God bless you. Yeah. No, I'm joking. No, the great actors. Rosario Dawson. Isn't yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Oh right. Yeah. So. So where is this house located? Uh, in the South Bay, uh, in San Jose, California. Oh, okay. All right. That's that's uh, on my must do list. I need yeah. to check this place ha- out. Have you been to the Bay Area? Uh, not the San Jose area. No, no, no. See, Joe, there, it's there are just as many uh, beautiful things to see there up in San Francisco, hmm. Oakland, North oh. Bay, South Bay. It, that, it's a beautiful area. So apparently, you do know the way to San Jose. I do. I, I, I yes, can, you can. You, you can be my tourist guide in LA. <laughs> I can. I can take you up to the bay. All right. So yep. let me get this straight. So there, that, that's a tourist site, and that makes sense. Your everything that you talk about, Joe, is a tourist site. What doesn't make any sense to me is people going to Amityville for a tourist <laughs> site. Because I'm like, what do you hope? Because at least you, they say you want to see the sign of of the murder. You say it's a piece of history. Same thing with yours. Mine, I'm like, are you hoping to find the ghosts? Do you want to find them? <laughs> you know, that house, though, has become so iconic because of the film. And if you if you get into Halloween like I do, there are people who make these little Halloween villages, and you can buy that Amityville right. horror house to add to your Halloween village. So that home has become iconic. But after the movie came out, a lot of the neighbors complained that people yeah. would descend on there, like nuns <laughs> and people from England and Ireland. They would like take pieces of the sod yeah. and try to take pieces. And I was like, why? Do you, if it is possessed, do you want that with you? It's like taking the house <laughs> to New Orleans. Like, why? Yeah, I wouldn't want to take any of that home. That just in case it's right. Just out. in case. Yeah. You, say the demons are real. Great job. Yeah, yeah. Now, a little bit of breaking news. We'll kind of close on this. Um, I just read within the last day or so that a home on 12305 Fifth Helena Drive in Brentwood, which is near the whole OJ thing we were just talking about, um, that home, the current owners, the home just recently went up for sale for like $7 million, and the people who bought it have I'll put in a request for permits to demolish the home and people are outraged um, because the home that was built in 1929 was purchased in February of 1962 for $77,500 by one Marilyn Monroe. Six months later, she was found dead in the bedroom on August 5th. Uh, it sold for over seven million dollars, and now the current homeowners want to demolish oh. it, which outrages me. Like, yeah. why would you buy a home that you knowingly yeah. know was Marilyn Monroe's final home, and you buy it for the property, and you want to demolish the house? I don't understand that. I don't get it. Um, I tried to visit the location way back in two thousand five. I uh, I don't even think we had Google Maps yet. I had a paper map in my hand, and I tracked 
the map to a gate that the owners at the time had thrown a black tarp over because they got too many looky-loos peering through the fence. I was able to kind of get up over the fence and look at the back side of the house. Um, but if the city doesn't put a stop to it, uh, they will demolish uh, Maryland's final resting place, which is uh, just tragic to me. I, I, even if the city doesn't get involved, like on the government level, I wonder if, I mean, I, I'm sure people are going to start some sort of grassroots thing. Like, oh, yeah, that's how know, I found save, out about save, it. Was save it. You know, on uh, Facebook, people are already sure. uh, causing the a commotion. The only way to save it is probably to declare it a historical site. They have to, yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. Fact, they would have to do that. Now, I know she wasn't there long, and she lived in a lot of different places uh, in L.A., but uh, this was her final home in uh, and, I, I, and I'm saying this is the case, but what if it's like a Saudi billionaire who doesn't even care, doesn't right. even know, just yeah. bought it. It's like, I like the property. I'm going to build a gaudy yeah. house there. Oh, but yeah. it, you know what you're getting into. Knock it off. <laughs> let, let's hope Let's hope someone goes in and maybe makes an offer and says, I want to preserve it, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, anything else before we wrap up? Did you have any other locations you wanted to touch on? No, no. I'm, I, I've am I been down enough rabbit holes right now, and we all yes. know it's Halloween season, even yes. though it's September. <laughs> yeah, we have some fun stuff coming up. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, oh, probably in about a month or so, we are going to talk about the 60th anniversary of the assassination of uh, oh, JFK. Yes. Yep. And uh, I have a trip planned to Dallas in a, about oh, a month or so. No. So I will have some cool stories for that particular episode. Nice. Um, but yeah, with Halloween rolling around, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll have some fun uh, rabbit holes go down. Yep. And uh, Nick, you've given me some today to think about and to research when I get home. So great one, guys. Thank you. Always yes. enjoy talking about this stuff with you yes same here joe uh, thank you for listening those yeah. out there yes and we'll see you in a few weeks have a good night everybody